Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Just quickly off the top, I just want to mention that this press conference is embargoed, as well as any remarks or comments given during the duration of it or in the media Q&A, and that embargo will lift once the bill is tabled at approximately 3 p.m. today. With that, I'll give it to the Premier. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. I'm pleased to be here with Rick McIver, our Minister of Municipal Affairs, to announce new measures to defend our provincial jurisdiction. For years now, even though the Liberal government in Ottawa has had the barest of representation in our province, they've been imposing their destructive agenda on Alberta taxpayers. We see this as Alberta Liberals enacting policies that will devastate our province's economy. We see this when they fail to provide Alberta with our fair share of per capita program funding. And we see this when they actively work around us to sign funding agreements with municipalities and provincially regulated and funded organizations that run counter to Alberta's interests and priorities. Section 92 of the Constitution states that municipalities fall within the exclusive jurisdiction of the provinces. The terms could not be more clear or more certain. And yet, as we've come to see far too often, the federal government extends itself too far and interferes in our provincial jurisdiction. And we aren't the only province to see this and be troubled by it. Last November, during our Council of the Federation meeting in Halifax, <clears throat> premiers across the country were united in opposing Ottawa's practice of stepping over our provincial governments to make agreements directly with municipalities. And many of us spoke about pursuing legislation similar to what uh, is a, a, in existence in Quebec, which prohibits the federal government from bypassing their provincial government when making deals with municipalities. In fact, uh, the uh, federal, or the Quebec minister uh, made sure that we all had a copy of that legislation before we left that day. So today, this is no longer just talk in Alberta. Today, we are taking back more of our jurisdictional control and telling Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his cabinet that they cannot make deals without our express approval. And this afternoon, I'm pleased to table the Provincial Priorities Act to do just that. Albertans are uninterested in the virtue signaling from Ottawa and the related strings that come with this. We are interested in our fair share of federal funding to move forward with our priorities on roads, on infrastructure, and on housing. Now, let's be clear, when we talk about federal funding, we mean money that comes from Canadian taxpayers. For much of our recent history, Albertans have paid far more in federal taxes than we get back in federal programs and transfers. Even during the last economic downturn, one of the worst in our history, we were still the largest net contributor to federal finances. And yet we consistently receive less than our provincial neighbours in per capita funding. And when we do receive funding, those federal dollars come with ideological strings attached, offer offering funding on its own terms, bypassing the provinces, and forcing municipalities to dance to Ottawa's tune, like funding for so-called safe supply, or electric buses that don't work, or solar and wind projects when we need reliable baseload power, or what we're seeing with the games being played over the housing accelerator funds. In other cases, Ottawa ignores programs already in place and wastefully spends on duplicative programs like pharmacare and dental care. Well, what we really need is envelope funding to expand existing provincial programs that already exist in these areas. Funding for what Alberta's priorities are that we need. Federal interference, we don't. Ottawa should be staying in its own lane. But at the end of the day, I think I know what's happening. Justin Trudeau has said his job is boring. Well, I'll suggest that's because he doesn't actually know what his job is, and therefore he isn't doing it. Because if he were doing his job, he wouldn't have enough time to meddle in my ability to do my job and the ability of other premiers to do their jobs. So here is a partial list of the things he and his government are not doing that they could and should do instead of interfering in provincial matters. He should get rid of the consumer carbon tax. He should fund on-reserve housing and health care. He should close the gap in funding for on-reserve addiction treatment for First Nations. He should provide per capita funding for housing and road infrastructure. He should collaborate to build strong economic corridors. He should develop an aggressive plan on international trade to get our natural resources to market, including a strategy to transport hydrogen and ammonia for export. He should bring in the clean energy investment tax credit that he has promised, including for carbon capture utilization and storage. He should address public safety concerns resulting from their lenient bail system. 
He should manage federal finances, deficits, and debt in order to combat the inflation that is squeezing every Canadian today. So if I ran through the full list of things that are in federal jurisdiction that they are not doing, we'd be here all afternoon. But these examples clearly show that Ottawa is neglecting its own responsibilities while meddling needlessly in ours. Albertans don't want federal funding to show the world how virtuous we are or to polish Canada's halo internationally. We want our provincial share of per capita federal funding for roads, for infrastructure, and for housing. Projects that will make a real difference for Albertans. The way we see it, federal and provincial funding should be spent collaboratively, not, for, not at cross purposes. And it should be spent on Alberta's priorities and not on Ottawa's, because after all, a lot of that money came from hardworking Alberta taxpayers in the first place. But this federal government has never let reality get in the way of a good headline, and never missed an opportunity to grab more control from the provinces. Our government believes Albertans are entitled to their fair share of federal funding and to have that funding spent on priorities that matter to them. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure that happens, including through this legislation, which signals that Alberta will act to ensure the Constitution's integrity and that we won't put up with any further manipulation or political interference from Ottawa. And now we'll invite Minister Rick McIver up to share more. Thank you, Premier, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. Premier Smith has spoken at length about Bill 18 and our government's objective to ensure Alberta is treated fairly when it comes to federal funding, while preventing overreach into areas of municipal and provincial jurisdiction. I'll be brief, but I'd like to share my perspective as Minister of Municipal Affairs on this legislation and what it means for Alberta's municipalities. There is no doubt that Alberta is being shortchanged by the federal government, and that includes our municipalities across Alberta. We must work together to address our province's needs while making sure our efforts and resources are not duplicated and wasted. But it's difficult to achieve this level of cohesion and collaboration when one of the parties doesn't have a voice at the table or isn't aware what the other governments are doing. Now, no, nowhere is the need for Alberta's voice more evident than on the housing file. This is an area of provincial jurisdiction, yet Alberta continues to be left out of the conversation. For example, the federal government recently made funding agreements to help build housing in Calgary and Edmonton while excluding the rest of the province. And while it's great to see our federal counterparts wake up to the need for affordable housing in our two largest cities, Alberta is much more than Edmonton and Calgary. Municipalities across the province are trying to address the housing supply in their communities. They are being ignored. And this is a big part of the reason why the federal government must include us in their plans to provide housing support. Not only is the federal government neglecting the rest of Alberta, they've made funding arrangements with other provinces for housing, including British Columbia and Quebec. In fact, around the same time in February, I believe it was the day apart, the federal minister rolled into Edmonton, made a $175 million commitment the very next day, he went next door to our good neighbour, British Columbia, with a very similar population base and made a $2 billion promise. Let that sink in. We're getting a bad deal. Some of the, these are just some examples of the federal government's long history of ignoring the province's jurisdiction and playing politics with issues as important as housing. It's clear that Alberta is not being treated equally, and this is exactly why we need a provincial voice present, to make sure we get a, the best deal and a fair deal for our province, our municipalities, and those Albertans that need housing. We reject the idea that the provinces should not be involved in these decisions, because we are best positioned to understand the local needs and concerns of communities all across our province. Now, I appreciate municipalities will have many questions about what this legislation means for them. First, I want to make it clear, this legislation will not impact any agreements between Alberta municipalities and the federal government that are currently in place, as long as those agreements don't include impossible to support terms like the possibility of forbidding natural gas to go to homes, that can't be let to stand. The requirement for provincial approval would apply to any municipality that seeks to enter into, amend, extend, or renew an agreement with the federal government. Anything like that would require prior provincial approval as per the Provincial Priorities Act. 
But agreements that are already in place between municipalities and federal government, again, would not require that approval unless they have terms that are, can't be lived with. For example, again, forbidding natural gas hookups into the homes. So it's taxpayer money that's meant for municipalities. We need to make work together to ensure Alberta's communities get their fair share because every municipality has housing issues. As Premier Smith has mentioned, we expect this work to occur over the summer with the intention to bring new regulations into force early 2025. Municipal Affairs will be talking to Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of, of Alberta to get their guidance on these regulations and I'm confident that we will have many conversations with many municipalities about what our goal is with this legislation. We will take our time to make sure we get it right so we can work more effectively together and get a better deal for Albertans as a full partner in Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We'll now go to our media Q&A portion. A reminder, we'll be taking one question and one follow-up today. Please state your name and outlet before asking your question. We'll start off with questions here in the room before making our way to the phones. Go to the first at the mic. I wonder if we uh, have a problem with the mic there. Should we... Uh Can you hear me now? Good. Okay. Shayla Anskowski with CTV News in Edmonton here. I'm, I'm wondering from the Premier, who specifically asked you for this legislation and how do you believe it will actually help Alberta get its fair share of funding you say is being left on the table? Well, Albertans did. Um, when we had a fair deal panel that happened years ago, there were tens of thousands of Albertans who, who participated in the process and talked about us asserting our authority um, on, under the Constitution in a whole range of areas. Then I won the leadership on the basis of promising an Alberta Sovereignty Act that once again would assert our areas of constitutional ju jurisdiction. And I won an election knowing that that was going to be one of the priorities. So Albertans, we, we consulted widely about making sure Albertans understood that we were going to defend the Constitution, we were going to defend vigorously all of our areas of jurisdiction, and this is just one example of how we're going to do it, and we'll do much more. In terms of defending it, what will the consequences be for those provincial entities who don't follow this legislation? Is this just a signal to Ottawa of what you would like to have happen, or is there any teeth? Well, it won't be, it won't be allowed. I mean, the, the provincial entities get their regulatory <coughs> authority from us. They get their legislative authority from us. So we've, um, we're, we're making it against the law for them to, to uh, come into an agreement with the federal government without our approval. So they won't be able to do it. Oh, hi, okay. uh, Graham Thompson with The Star today. Uh, Premier... Uh, last month, uh, Randy Boissonneau was talking about this sort of thing happening, and I'm quoting what he said to the media. He said, it's going to add more bureaucracy, it's going to slow things down, it's going to take longer for money to reach municipalities, and I have found in my experience that it hurts smaller municipalities more, so the question Albertan should be asking is why? Well, he's wrong, number one. Uh, Jean-Francois Roberge was the person who shared this legislation with me when I was at the Council of the Federation. And I can tell you their experience was that it actually reduced red tape because when it came down to having a negotiation about a funding transfer for Quebec, they had a single government to deal with, the provincial government, and a single amount of money, $900 million that they transferred. Looked pretty darn efficient in British Columbia when the federal gov government breezed through town and, and dropped $2 billion in negotiation, again, with a single government, uh, Premier Eby. And in our province, what we've seen is a special deal for the large municipalities, and you know, good for them for actually having the ability to negotiate that. $175 million for Edmonton, $238 million for Calgary, but there are only six small municipalities that in combined got $13.6 million. And I have to tell you, I just simply don't think there's bandwidth at the federal level to do negotiations with all 350 of our municipalities, which means people get left out. And it's outrageous that we're short at least a billion dollars and probably more like $2 billion on housing. Because not only are we getting shortchanged on the Housing Accelerator Fund, but there is also a rapid housing fund that we have only been given 2% of the total amount, even though our population is 12% of the, uh, of the total amount of, of population. On top of that, if you talk to uh, Devin Dreeshen, he'll tell you that we have put in requests for nine uh, highways to have joint funding. We're zero for nine. 
We've received none of that. So I would say that uh, what will happen is that this should streamline things because they'll know that if they want to partner with us, we're happy to be here as a partner and we'll be able to negotiate with them. Just to follow up then, how does this strong arm the federal government into giving you what you want? For example, you talked about the $175 million given to Edmonton that was back a few months ago in February. Um, if you think that's not enough, then how does doing what you're doing now somehow strong arm Ottawa into giving you more money? They could just simply say no. Well, I, I suppose they could, but then I, I would have to question whether or not they're ab abiding by the Constitution because we have a, a, a history in our country of collaborative federalism. And if they're going to use their federal spending power in a way that punishes some provinces and rewards others for purely political purposes, they're opening themselves up to a legal challenge on that basis. And we'd be quite happy to see them in court. What I think would be far better is for them to deal with us the way they did on health care. All of the provinces put forward a united front. We managed to negotiate a deal that was fair for all of the provinces. All of the provinces agreed that they would have clauses that if anyone managed to get a sweetener, that it would apply to all of us. That's how federalism should work, is let's get together, put politics aside. Doesn't matter what your political stripe is at the provincial level. We all share a combined need to make sure that our citizens get the amount of federal funding that we deserve. And so there are th that is a very good example of how cooperative federalism should work. But the, the fact that they are, are, are not doing that on a whole range of fronts, it's unacceptable. It's not fair to our municipalities, it's not fair to our Alberta taxpayers, and we won't stand for it. And Catherine Rakowski, Alberta Today. Uh, so a question on that per capita, because you'd mentioned the rapid housing initiative and that that summer you only got 2.5 but when I had asked the federal government last summer about that, they said there were three rounds of the program and actually Alberta got 11.4% of the total funding. So when you're talking about per capita, are you going to be considering the overall program or does it have to be every single year? How, how, what do you consider fair on well, a per capita? Well, look, I, I just conferred with my uh, housing minister before coming up here today. And um, so, I, I mean, we can get those exact numbers for you. But generally speaking, we should be getting the same per capita funding. That was a principle that uh, was agreed to under the, under the former government. They, they changed the Canada Health Transfer and the Canada Social Transfer so that they are per capita. Um, we also had a, a change to the, the way infrastructure was done so that it would also be fair. And so th this is upending, I think, a principle that we've lived with in, in uh, Canada for, for over a decade. And, and they should be. Uh, delivering those dollars in a fair way, and they should be deferring to our jurisdiction. They don't know what the 24 mid-sized communities are in Alberta. They don't know where the pockets of accelerated growth are in this province. Do you know who does know? My Minister of Municipal Affairs. That's why when they do these kinds of announcements, they should be talking to him as well as my housing minister. Otherwise, it's going to be unfair. We're not going to get our fair share, but we're also not going to have it distributed to those who need it most. And, and when you reject, say you decide something is virtue signaling strings, we don't want this funding if it comes with these strings, will the province step in and then fund? Like, what's going to happen to those bodies who are applying for the funding and they're not going to get it because you say no? Well, you know, I look at it the other way. I mean, oftentimes I hear from municipalities that if they, they could accelerate some of their funding if we got three parties to the table at the same time. So... Um, a municipal entity, a provincial entity, and a federal entity all coming together to fund something can move things along. Just look at what happened with the, the Green Line LRT in Calgary and other, t t uh, other types of transportation projects like that. And so for us to know what is on the table could actually improve the ability of, of many of our, our agencies that we give grants to to be able to leverage that so that they can get funding from both levels. But we're not going to allow the federal government to come in work directly with a provincial entity that we give a regulate, regulated mandate to and circumvent the things we want to do. Like, I, I, we, we were simply just not going to allow them to go down a pathway of supporting safe supply in this province. We're looking at what's happened in British Columbia, having the nurses talk about what a disaster it is there, how they've gone down a pathway where, where now they're expected to give crack pipes to, to patients in the, in the hospital wards and not even confiscate their, 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 uh, their drugs or their, or their weapons. That is not a path we're going down here. And so we know that the federal government has on certain issues a diametrically opposed view to what it is we want to do. And so we're not going to, uh, to go down and fund those, those pathways. That being said, I think that I've given examples of where we can work collaboratively. And I hope that it is in that spirit that we will be, be able to. 
uh, one of the, the reviews that we did, for instance, was looking at the number of different uh, 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 agreements that are out there. My department has led that effort. We've had most of our departments respond. There's about 14,000 agreements. 800 of them have been flagged as problematic. So those are 800 that I'm going to take a closer look at. But maybe you should take away from that that 13,200 aren't problematic. And so in the vast majority of cases, we'll be perfectly fine having that partnership. But in the areas where they are trying to circumvent the policies that we have been elected on and circumvent our mandate with ministries that, uh, and uh, departments that we fund and that we legislate, it's not on. I don't do that. I don't go around trying to find a, a federally regulated entity to use my spending power to circumvent what they do. It's outrageous that they do this, and we're not going to allow it anymore. Hi, Premier. Brianna Carson Smith with Global News. Can you give some more details on how this is actually going to work? So say a city says, I need funding for this. They have to come through you. They, can't, they obviously can't go directly to the feds. They would theoretically know more details in terms of what funding they would need. So who's going to be at the table? Who's going to be the intermediary? Uh, how, are, how is this program actually going to work? Well, I can tell you um, I'm in talking about the reporting up to my department because we'll be the keeper of all of this information. Uh, my, my DM has told me it'll be pretty simplified that we'll be asking a question on various grant applications. Do you receive federal funding? Checkbox, yes or no. How much? It's that simple. And then we'll be able to collate that, be able to have those rise to the top, be able to assess whether they are offside with uh, the approach that, that we want to take. That's, that's, the, the, that's the going to be the sort of the first blush that we end up going through. Um, in the case of the municipalities, I know that there are currently 64 federal agreements with the uh, City of Calgary, 44 with the City of Edmonton, and five to eight agreements with the other municipalities. And the reason we know that is because we asked them and they gave us the information. So I'll turn it over to, to Rick to talk a little bit more about that because we are not intending to have this be retroactive, but we wanted to have a sense of the kind of agreements that have been signed. Thanks, Premier. And, and let me just say this. I'd like to think we're pretty good at this. There's a wide range of uh, funding agreements that we have with municipalities, starting with the local government fiscal framework, formerly the MSI. Uh, we work with municipalities based on a, day, on a daily basis. So this uh, this is some this is a process uh, working with municipalities, sharing information, approving grants. This is uh, we're good at it. We do it every day, and I don't see it as being a problem. So they will go to you rather than so post-secondary schools would apply through the province rather than going well post-secondary schools I'll, I'll leave that to the premier but uh, yeah for each minister but uh, I'll, I'll talk about municipal affairs they would t talk to us if they want to make an agreement with the federal government and we would listen our, our job is to facilitate getting money to the municipalities but not at cross purposes with our government's uh, priorities and our government's policies and definitely not at cross purposes with the Constitution which makes municipalities exclusive provincial jurisdiction we're not ceding any ground to the federal government they've tried to take it but we'll we're not ceding it we will not cede it and then similar to Kat's question uh, there have been concerns raised about this delaying project timelines I wonder if you would be in support of providing intermediary funding uh, in order to make sure that projects aren't delayed uh, while this rigmarole is happening you know what? We will uh, work cooperatively with municipalities as we always do, and, and uh, if, the, if the federal government is reasonable when we come forward, then that will, that will help. If they're unreasonable, we'll, we will deal with that. But uh, our goal is to get uh, money into municipalities' hands. But let's let's be clear: the uh, right now we're way behind on the housing. We can identify that British Columbia, with a very similar population base as ours, has got in excess of twice as much funding from the federal government as we have. I think the municipalities, if they're dealing with twice as much funding uh, from us or through the federal government uh, and us, will be very happy with the results. Uh, and and not unhappy and that's our goal is because uh, other provinces are getting a full share based on their population we're not we're somewhere depending on how you look at it between two and five times less and we need to bridge that gap and the, the federal government I think has made it clear they without being pushed they won't bridge that gap and we intend to make it better for them to bridge that gap than not bridge that gap go ahead Janet Sorry, I thought we were going to phone. Janet French from CDC. Um, we understand from the Quebec government that their law does not apply to post-secondary institutions in Alberta. Uh, sorry, <laughs> in Quebec. So why make this uh, law apply to post-secondaries in Alberta? Well, they are also um, uh, entities that are are that get their mandate through our legislation. So we're going to ensure that any uh, entity that we regulate is has to um, has to follow these rules. 
could there not then potentially be an opening for some kind of political interference with the kinds of projects that get funded at universities, colleges, and, and institutions then? Well, what would you say to that? Well, I'd ask the federal government the same way. How are they politically interfering by using their federal spending power to fund certain research projects? I mean, that's, that's what we're worried about, is that the federal government is doing that. Oh, you, that, you that, they fund, that they fund in a certain way based on a certain ideology, and that's what we're going to be able to, to determine once that becomes a, a lot more transparent. Do you have an example, though, of a, of a federal funding for just a post-secondary project? Just look at the social research fund that they have. I think it's $400 million, and you'll see the kind of projects they fund. Perfect. Thank you, Janet. We're just going to hop over to the phones for a few questions before coming back to the room. Operator, would you be able to put through our first caller, please? Matthew Black, Edmonton Journal. Well, my understanding is right that you're holding consultations after this bill is presented. Like, aren't you putting the cart before the horse here? Well, I, no one raised that concern with Justin Trudeau, I suppose, when he came in and uh, announced that he was going to be funding, in a very specific way, Edmonton and Calgary and six municipalities. I don't think he did a lot of consultation before the fact on that. We, we've been very transparent um, all the way through for 18 months that we were going to defend our constitutional authority and that we were going to take every measure to ensure that uh, the federal government does not use its federal spending power to circumvent our, our policies. It just so happens it's come to a head in the last month because they've been so outrageous and egregious in how unfairly they're treating our province and how unfairly they're treating our municipalities. So we will certainly consult this, the whole process we go through with legislation. We let people know generally what direction we're going. We provide the specifics when we introduce the bill into the legislature. We have a period of, uh, of debate and then a period of uh, amendments that we can make. Then finally we pass it through third reading and it goes to royal assent and proclamation. And then there's a period of time where we uh, consult on the regulations for implementation. So um, I think people understood the general direction we're going and now we will consult further on how we implement. Is there any concern that this will provoke a, you know, a mad scramble to get a bunch of deals done before all of that happens? <laughs> Well, I would I would hope not. I mean, look, I mean we we want to we want to have a fair deal for every single municipality. We we want to we want to be helpful in that regard. What we have seen is that the federal government is 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 picking favorites and they're not being fair. They're not giving us our fair per capita funding and they are making municipalities jump through a bunch of hoops and agree to a bunch of onerous conditions in order to be able to receive it. We we want to be able to protect our mun municipalities from having to abide by onerous federal uh, uh, rules that that are imposed unilaterally, and we also want to make sure that we, we get our fair share. So I, I would hope that um, the municipalities would, would stand together and be cheering this along, knowing that it will result in more money coming to Alberta, which, we, which means more money for the municipalities. That's how we had success at the federal level in negotiating a fair health transfer deal, is the provinces stood together and we all said that we wanted to be able to get the same per capita funding and that if anyone got a better deal, that, uh, that uh, all the others would, uh, would be able to ask for the same. So it worked. So there is, there is a strength and solidarity, and that's what we're hoping the municipalities will see, that everyone will be better off with, uh, with having the federal government have to deal with us as their negotiating partner. Thank you. Operator, can you put through our next caller, please? Carrie Tate, Global Mail. Hi, Premier. Thanks for taking my question. Um, sometimes a municipality could have a different priority than the provincial government. Voters could want that. I'm wondering why uh, Alberta is prioritizing its priorities over the priorities of, of the municipality that would have negotiated its own deal. Let me uh, let Minister McIver respond to that. So the uh Municipalities have their own tax base. If they have a priority different than what the federal governments might be, they collect property tax and have other sources of revenue that they, uh, under our very permissive legislation, they have the right to spend as they see fit on behalf of, of their citizens. Um, on the other hand, they're part of Alberta, and uh, we have the ability to put uh, policies in place in the in the uh, interest of all Albertans, and uh, we have done for a long time, we'll continue to do, but uh, I think most people that describe the Municipal Government Act of Alberta would describe it as permissive and not restrictive legislation. So they have quite a bit of latitude to do what they need to do, and they have a, their own source of taxes to, do, uh, uh, to use for that too. The other point about it is too, we routinely, with our current and other funding things, talk to municipalities what their priorities are, and we look for ways to agree with them. And I don't see any reason why that cooperative and productive relationship will change. 
it just might be more productive because we might have more uh, fair share of funding from the federal government that we're not getting now. We'll have more to talk about, and won't that be great? Um, and I, I'm uh, still a little confused on the consequences. Premier, you said if um, a provincial entity, whether it's a municipality or a university, strikes a deal separately, that they would be breaking the law. It would be against the law. Mm -hmm. What would the consequence of breaking the law be? What will the government do in response to that? It would be invalid. Um, it's not a valid contract. So that's that's what happens when you when you pass legislation. We would expect that all of the entities that we govern that they would abide by, by the, the rules that they're to be governed by. Thank you. And we'll take one more question from the phones before coming back here in person. Operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Scott Strouser, Post Media. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, has the province thought of the possibility of the federal government or even one of the provincial entities taking the province to court over this? Well, look, I mean, the Constitution has two levels of government that are where our powers are delineated the the federal government and the provincial government um, and the provincial government has the sole and exclusive authority to regulate uh, matters of local concern including local government so um, i would say that we have the power to draft legislation that affects how our uh, governed entities operate just like quebec that's all we're asking for is to be treated like quebec quebec seems to be able to have a special place in confederation that when a federal program is announced it's like clockwork. They say, no, we're not going to abide by your rules, but give us the per capita money. And they always get it. And part of the reason is because they've created a legislative framework that allows them to do that and forces the federal government to deal with the province directly. So we're just doing what, what Quebec has done. Okay, thank you. And my follow-up is how you would define provincial priorities. Seems like obvious, but is that based on party policies or existing laws? Like, how do you define that in the legislature? How do we define which? Uh, provincial priorities. Provincial priorities. Well, um, look, I mean, there there are uh, mostly when we do uh, spending, it doesn't have an ideological tint to it. If you if you need to build a road, you need to build a road. If you need to build housing, you need to build housing. If you need to do some other type of critical infrastructure, you need to do that. It's the federal government that's injecting ideology into these debates. Because look at the housing um, accelerator funding. They're making a mandate to municipalities that they've got to upend all of their carefully negotiated zoning agreements with all of their neighborhoods in return for receiving funding. I mean, those are the kind of things that the federal government is imposing on municipalities as a quid pro quo for receiving funding. We're watching with grave concern as uh, Stephen Guibault talks about net zero this and net zero that, including net zero housing. What does that mean? Well, I can tell you what I've observed in other jurisdictions. It's meant in Kelowna, for instance, not hooking up new homes to natural gas. In other jurisdictions, it's meant banning gas stoves and gas fireplaces. We are simply not going down that path. And if that becomes the kind of ideological tag that the federal government is putting onto the kind of funding that they, they want to, to deliver, we're just not going to let it happen. So I would say that uh, under most circumstances, we can probably agree on what the priorities are based on what our funding partners uh, uh, and the entities that we regulate tell us are their priorities. We get a capital list every year from, the, uh, uh, from our, our school boards. We are developing a capital plan for health care and addiction funding and mental health treatment. We have uh, uh, various housing entities that give us their recommendations for affordable housing support or seniors lodges. And of course, the municipalities have a, a whole range of of requests that they make of us from, from time to time, and most of that is perfectly fine. It's when we have the federal government using its federal spending power to impose an ideological agenda that we are going to say, uh, no, that's not on side with what we want to do. So a few of the examples I'm concerned about, I mentioned, the net zero housing regulations, net zero electricity, as well as uh, the issues that we see around safe supply. Those are, those are the three main areas that have me uh, with grave concern about how the federal government is trying to use its federal spending power to undermine our policy objectives. Thank you. We'll come back to the room now at the mic there. Marc-Antoine Leblanc, Radio Canada. Um, my question is a little bit similar to the last one, but I just want to go back to the approval process. I know the exact process is still to be decided, but what do you think it will look like in terms of province interest, and what's your definition of province interest? 
Well, look, I, I would say that, that what will very likely happen is that there will be funding envelopes that the federal government announces. Like, look, they're not shy about saying when they want to spend money in provincial areas of jurisdiction. And what that will trigger is a relationship between the relevant minister and the federal government to be able to negotiate to see if we can come to terms on how we would use that, that federal funding. That's what I would anticipate. So it would have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and as I've said, we've been able to find a number of ways that we've had collaborative agreements, healthcare being one, funding uh, transit being another. There, there will be a, a, a funding, funding roads if they ever decide to build them in our province again. Those will be the kind of things that we'll be able to, to come to terms with. But, but what we don't like is the way they're manipulating municipalities into upending their laws in order to get a little bit of funding and then playing one region off against another, big cities off against small cities, and not giving us our, our per capita share. So as I say, sometimes the federal government behaves in a way that we think is very part, uh, partner oriented and very collaborative, but sometimes they're pushing an agenda. So we'd have to judge it on a case by case basis. And why not consult um, the municipalities before writing the bill instead of writing the bill and then consult the municipalities? Well, look, this is, this is the way legislation develops as you develop sort of a high level principle you look for, uh, for areas that, uh, that you find problems in. This has emerged as an area that we see a problem with. And now we've put forward the framework and we'll be consulting on, on the implementation. And every, uh, I'm, we, this, is, this is sort of the process that you, you go through from, from a government point of view. So um, I, I believe that uh, we've given very clear indication to all of the municipalities, the direction that we were heading. I believe we've given very clear indication to Albertans the direction that we were heading. And this has just emerged as a result of the absolute unfairness that the, the federal government is treating our municipalities with. Did you want to add? Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Premier. And, and uh, while we haven't consulted in detail on everything in the legislation, in broad terms, we have had discussions with municipalities. Uh, I raised the possibility of this legislation recently in speeches that I gave at rural municipalities of Alberta and Alberta municipalities. And I can tell you the uh, 300 plus municipalities that so far are getting zero from the federal government are very much in favor of us getting fair funding for Alberta because uh, if we don't, there's a very high possibility that most of them will get nothing. So while well, they haven't been fully consulted, I would say that uh, they are uh, in favor of us having more money to spend with municipalities instead of less. That at the end of the day, that has to be better for more municipalities, has to be better for more Alberta citizens that need housing and other services that uh, come through the provincial government. So, and, uh, and we talk to them all the time. So the additional consultation that needs to be done, we're in touch with them constantly. We will get right to work uh, as the legislation is passed and doing that, and we feel very good about uh, our ability to uh, come to terms. And next with the mic. Jonathan Bradley, Western Standard. I wanted to ask uh, Premier Smith uh, some off-topic questions, but I think uh, it would be relevant uh, to hear her opinion on it. So, Alberta NDP MLA Marilyn Schmidt instigated an altercation against United Conservative Party MLA Jackie Lovely on Monday, prompting him to receive a reprimand. What do you think about that? Well, I, I can tell you it is probably the most serious case of intimidation that I have seen in my time here, not only now, but also the time I was here before. I uh, happened to be at an event with um, uh, MLA Lovely that evening, and I can confirm for you that she was scared and she was rattled and she was afraid to go back to uh, a committee meeting where she feared that she might face a another confrontation with this individual. And it's not just her, it was witnessed by, um, by uh, legislative officers who reported it to the speaker. So uh, there's a little bit of a difference of opinion uh, between the MLAs about how it went down, but I can tell you it's Ms. Lovely's version that was validated by those who witnessed it. And that is not appropriate at all. The speaker made it very clear that there's a little bit of who and fro that happens in the legislature. Under his supervision, he has to rule on things. It is not appropriate for anybody to be walking alongside and harassing another member outside the chamber, especially when it's a male and it's, a, and it's a, uh, against a female. That's outrageous. So I would say that um, uh, I'm glad that he apologized, but I would, I would say that this is the kind of, of conduct that is completely unacceptable. And I would hope that he takes a reprimand seriously. 
Speaker of Legislative Assembly of Alberta, Nathan Cooper, said this incident was the most egregious case of unparliamentary conduct during his speakership. Do you believe Alberta NDP leader Rachel Notley should remove Schmidt from caucus over it? Why or why not? Look, I'm not going to cast judgment on what another leader should or shouldn't do, but I can tell you that uh, they certainly talk a lot on the other side of the chamber about the, the value of female members, the value of female voices, and their conduct did not show that in the way they treated MLA Lovely. And uh, I, I would hope that some of his colleagues would call him out for it rather than trying to defend him because it's indefensible, it's unacceptable. Thank you, Jonathan. We're gonna pop back over to the phones for a couple of questions. Operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Tiffany Goodwing, City News. Goodwing, but that's okay. Um, uh, Premier, uh, Mayor Jody Gondek uh, had a lot to say about this uh, legislation yesterday, and uh, she indicated that municipalities, such as her own, feel stuck in the middle, and they're sick of all the infighting between the province and the federal government. How do you expect this to affect your relationship with Mayor Gondek and other municipalities going forward? Well, you know, I hear from other council members about how the strings attached is now creating real problems for them. They're going to have to have a, a debate about completely upending all of their zoning that they have. And that is going to be very contentious. And so I, I have to say that their council is, is divided on whether or not it's reasonable and appropriate for the federal government to be essentially rewriting all of their zoning laws for them as a condition to receive three, $238 million in grants. And we don't think that that should be the case. We don't think that, um, that municipalities should have to rewrite their laws you know, to dance to a tune being set for them by the federal government. We want to make sure that there is a, a fair approach so that we get our, our proper per capita funding and so that uh, we can ensure that, that all municipalities are taken care of on, on their growth needs. Did you want to comment? Thank you. Yeah. The, uh, you don't have to be a constitutional lawyer to get elected to the province or a municipality, but the fact remains mm -hmm. Municipal authority is 100% in the hands of provincial governments, full stop. So uh, none of the mayors uh, or municipal councillors should be surprised that the province is stuck an oar in the water on this, uh, one that is our oar to put in the water according to the constitution of this great country. And we will work collaboratively with Calgary and all other municipalities to try to make sure that this funding can be be forwarded and uh, and uh, applied in that municipality and the other municipalities where we know housing is uh, desperately needed. We will we will uh, it work as we always do to be a positive and helpful partner. But uh, the fact is, it is possible that they we could have been invited to the table before this agreement was made and we were not so the natural consequence is unfolding now and we'll make the best of it and we expect the city will too and did you have a follow-up great and just yeah i do yes uh in your press release uh it says uh the federal government has shown time and time again that they put ideology before practicality uh, isn't that what you're doing here, and how is this more practical, Premier? It's it's not about ideology. It's about defending our constitutional authority. Um, so the federal government announces a school lunch program. They didn't even contact us to find out we already have a school lunch program with 58,000 kids that are covered by it. Why not? They announce a two-condition pharmacare program trying to pretend that it's a universal program. It's not. It just covers two conditions. They didn't even ask us about what we cover through Alberta Blue Cross and the 50 different uh, birth control methods and the 16 or so different uh, diabetes drugs. Why didn't they do that? They announced a dentistry program that uh, our dental association doesn't seem to want to be involved in, despite the fact that we also have a, a program through Alberta Blue Cross that they would have been allowed to piggyback on. So the, the, the fact of the matter remains that the, the, the federal government is constantly interfering in our constitutional mandate. They're uh, creating duplication, overlap, and they're not uh, trying to, to collaborate and, and work with the programs that we, uh, that we currently have. And, and that, to me, is, is the very definition of political. If they wanted to solve the problem, they would say, hey, what have you got, and how can we work to extend it? 
That would be a, a collaborative way for us to be able to jointly benefit. They, they did that on health care. It's mystifying to me why they haven't done that on, on every other program. And the only thing I can conclude is that because they want to play politics, because they have demonstrated that when they do want to work collaboratively with us, they will. So they're making the choices of when they do and when they don't. And they're doing it in our areas of jurisdiction. I don't do that to them. They shouldn't be doing it to me. Thank you. Operator, could put through our next caller here, please? Jason Markinsoff, CBC. Um, hello, Ms. Smith. If the provincial government had had its chance um, with this legislation uh, when Edmonton and Calgary made its deal on electric buses, would it have intervened to block those or redirect those? Here, well, I, I suppose Edmonton taxpayers are probably wishing that we, we would have been able to because they bought 60 buses that now don't work. And they need to buy another 250 million, uh, 250 buses that they don't have the budget for. Uh, we're hoping to avoid the same mistake in uh, in in Calgary, and we are we are hoping that when they do the RFP, they will offer a hydrogen bus as a, an alternative, because we are already in the process of piloting those in Edmonton and Strathcona County. Um, in our environment, with the temperatures that we have. These, these buses just simply don't, don't have the range that is needed for the ability to, to manage the, the, the job in uh, either of our major cities. So I would say that there's a better way for us to do it. Um, if they'd come to us, maybe what we could have worked on is the, the development and uh, expediting the, the line to the airport, which, uh, which I know is needed in both Calgary and, and Edmonton. We're, we're um, in the process of, of figuring out a commuter rail strategy to help take uh, more vehicles off the road between Calgary and Edmonton and other major centers. Like those are the kind of things that we could work on together. But because they are, they have an ideological viewpoint of what the right answer is. They're coming up with solutions that aren't necessarily going to work for us and are ultimately going to cost taxpayers um, in excess of what they would spend if we were to do it right in the first place. Earlier this week, your government uh, boasted about having reduced red tape by 33 percent. There's obviously a tracker somewhere. Does this legislation, what will ensue from it, add on the on, on what you guys consider red tape, or to have to reduce further? No, I'm not anticipating it. To uh, Rick has a, a pretty good uh, uh, analogy about how how much time he thinks it will take. If you're if you're having to fill out an application anyway, if we have department officials who are working on a file and a granting agreement anyway, then it, it really is just um, an additional amount of disclosure. Um, so I, I wouldn't anticipate that being the case. Well, the definition of red tape is uh, an order of government, the federal government that doesn't have a, a regular communication or regular uh, relationship with uh, over 300 municipalities suddenly having to develop one to make a, uh, a simple deal. And I, I will also say that so dealing with one person, one party being the provincial government certainly should be quicker than dealing with 300 plus. Uh, and in terms of the smaller municipalities, somebody asked an earlier question about red tape for the smaller municipalities. Well, with the federal deal, there will be no red tape because there won't be any money. So the I'm sure the small municipalities will be glad to uh, uh, review with us the five to eight uh, agreements that they have with the federal government in order to qualify for funding. I think that's, uh, if that if you want to call that red tape, and I don't, but even if you do, if that's the cost, uh, a couple minutes or 10 minutes to review five or eight different agreements in order to get funding for housing, I would think most municipalities in Alberta would say, thank you very much, that bit of a red tape, we'll have more of that, please. <laughs> Thank you. And we're running short on time, but we'll take our last two questions from the room here if we want to go to that mic now. Thanks. Uh, Darcy Robchan, City News. My first question was touched on, so I'll just jump to my follow-up. Uh, talking about ideologies, federal lib liberals are in power federally right now, so your government's going to put more scrutiny on these federal municipal contracts, I imagine. What happens in a few years from now when eventually there could be a federal conservative party? Is your government going to put the same amount of scrutiny on these uh, projects? Well, look, I, I would hope that the federal government would, uh, would treat us fairly. And I think that's been the history. The last time a, a federal government was in uh, as a, under the conservative banner, they, they did create funding arrangements that were based on per capita. 
they did talk about respecting the provincial jurisdiction, uh, and they and they talked about being a funding partner, and I think they lived up to it in some of the agreements that they signed. But that's how that's what we expect of our federal government that if they want to partner with us in areas of our jurisdiction, we're happy to. But they've got to they've actually got to pick up the phone, give us a call, and work together so that we can make sure that we're not duplicating. There isn't overlap. There isn't wasteful spending. They know what our programs are. They know how we can build on them. It's just a, a far more constructive way of approaching federalism. And I think we've seen that that is uh, the way that the uh, that conservatives operate. And we have the same expectation that that is how the liberal government should operate. Yeah. Thanks. It's Lisa Johnson from the Canadian Press. I just want to go back to this whole red tape issue. I'm sorry. I understand you're saying this is going to cut red tape um, and, and simplify things, but I this is the, the concern that Alberta municipalities has expressed over and over, is that they're worried that this is going to create more red tape. And your government doesn't even know the process or parameters or even like dollar amount threshold of what this application for approval from you is going to look like. So how can you assure municipalities today that this is not going to create red tape for their administrators? Some of these small towns only have a, a couple of staff members. How can you assure them today when we can't really even see the regulations? We know the small municipalities. We deal with them all the time. We have regular we have regular funding ar arrangements and agreements with them, including the local government fiscal framework, that we deal with them all the time. This, is, this will take essentially no time at all. And what's even better is they might actually get some money out of, out of a program but once Alberta gets their fair share because we're, they're getting nothing now. And again, so the best way to have no red tape is to get no funding. But I don't think that's the way municipalities would choose. I think they would choose to work with a partner that they're accustomed to, fill out a, a form once on what the federal arrangements are, have a discussion, and make a decision. Uh, that seems like a normal process to get uh, a grant agreement done. Not do, doesn't seem at all like red tape to me. And, and in fact, it, it, it piggybacks on regular communication that's already in place between our ministry and our government under this premier and the municipalities. And uh, I think if you talk to the, I don't know, 300 or so municipalities that are getting nothing out of the federal funding now, if it's a choice between an, uh, a short conversation and getting some funding as opposed to no conversation and get no funding, I think they'll be happy to have that short conversation. Because we've, we've already seen it. They've already got $2 billion committed to in British Columbia. They've already got $900 million committed to in Quebec. That's already been announced. If they were to try to give us the equivalent amount doing it announcement by announcement, they guess they've done an announcement in Calgary in November, an announcement in, in uh, Edmonton in February, another announcement that followed for six municipalities. How many announcements are they going to have to do? How many times is he going to have to fly here in order to make sure that all 300 plus municipalities are taken care of? That is the very definition of red tape. He could have come here once, could have announced a, a single deal, and then we could have been working on the administration of it in, uh, along the principles that we always use when we're trying to be fair with our municipal partners. Can you offer just a few more details about that? I mean, it sounds like you're suggesting, you said that this really is just an additional amount of disclosure, suggesting these are processes that are already in place. This will take for a bit, virtually no time, no added time at all. So are we talking about processes that are already in place where municipalities already are, are informing the province about certain funding agreements, and this just gives you the the ability to check mark those at the top like is that what you're saying here look I think it would go the other way I mean if, if if the federal government knew our expectation was that we would expect to be treated just like Quebec then we would do the same thing the negotiations would take place between my Minister of Municipal Affairs and their counterpart we would do an announcement and then we would have a funding formula to be able to make sure everybody got distributed the, the dollars fairly um, if they work collaboratively with us on the issue of pharmacare, they might have come and seen that we already have an Alberta Blue Cross system, and they could have talked to us about how we might have been able to expand that. I mean, the, the, it, we need to change the relationship with the federal government because they are doing an end run around us. In fact, they promised to. They said that uh, they were going to keep on doing this um, uh, rather than work with us directly, and that's just not acceptable. They don't do that with other provinces. We just expect to be treated the exact same way that they've treated British Columbia most recently and Quebec most recently. Perfect, and that'll conclude today's press conference. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, everyone. A reminder, the embargo lifts at approximately 3 p.m. when the legislation is tabled.